Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Scott Hartman. He's with the uh, Department of Integrative Biology, which for those of you who were here in earlier years, that used to be the Department of Zoology. Zoology. He's going to speak with us about having a bone to pick, the ins and outs of reconstructing dinosaur anatomy. I now get to ask Scott the five questions. Scott, where were you born? Uh, I was born actually in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin at an early age. Nice, at an early age. <laughs> And where did you go to high school at a later age? Um, I went to high school in uh, Lindbrook High, which was uh, in the Bay Area of uh, California. So I somewhere in there migrated quite a bit. Wow, I'm in Lindbrook. I haven't heard Lindbrook, of that. Lindbrook, yeah. Lindbrook, thank you. And then where'd you go for your undergraduate degree and what did you study? Um, I went to the University of Wyoming, in La the university, because there's only one of them in Wyoming, uh, in Laramie. And I, uh, I got my degree in integrative, I mean zoology. Thank you. And then where'd you go for your advanced degrees and what did you study? So I attended the Department of Geosciences right here because I can apparently only go to schools called UW. Um, <laughs> got uh, studied paleobiology and paleontology there. Good, and when did you finish your PhD? Uh, I want to say summer 2021, but since time has lost all meaning the last couple of years, like it could, be, it could have been 2020. <laughs> Our speaker for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, and when did you come to UW-Madison? Uh, 2013. Okay, great. And then you also have a, um, a business called Skeletal Drawing? Oh, yeah. I've, so prior to coming back to enter academia, I had done um, a longer than I cared to admit period of time where I also did scientific diagrams of anatomy, mostly of extinct things, not always. Um, and yeah, that's called the drawing.com is my, my personal website where those, those. Great, thank you very much. It's, I'm looking forward to this. Um, can't beat dinosaurs. Uh, would you please join me in welcoming Scott Hartman to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you. 
fish are coming out of here. The fish are coming out of here. Thank you. Yeah. Is this working now? And is this working? This is working. I don't think you had it on. Oh. Could you not hear me or was I just loud? Well, we can't hear you on, on YouTube and so. Oh, that's the problem. Yep. Okay. Are we working? Why don't you keep going and I'll check. Thank you. Okay. Let's do it. All right, so basically what I settled upon then, as I was saying, was neck length and gigantism. Because it turns out, while the question about being gigantic, I feel like is obvious and intuitive. How on earth could animals the size of whales exist on land where the water doesn't support them? But also, I would suggest to you the neck length there is itself almost as impressive physiologically once you realize what the barriers are to it, why other animals don't go the sauropod route with long necks. So I should note in full disclosure, not all sauropods have crazy long necks like this. Some of them have necks that are only like 12 or 13 feet long. Um, they're still quite a bit larger than in giraffes, but you know, they didn't have to be long necked. On the other hand, the sheer length of the necks and the frequency of them exceed any other terrestrial animals and deserves an explanation anatomically and or physiologically as to what is going on. And if it's good, why weren't other things doing it? Why aren't they really now? Um, to put this in perspective, here is two scale, <laughs> some representative sauropod necks from fairly common lengths to the longest known cervical series on Supersaurus here. Um, yes, that's a real name. No, I didn't name it. Uh, the same gentleman who named this also named another one Ultrasaurus. Latin was presumably not his first language. Um, I'm just happy there wasn't like a third one that could be named really Bigosaurus. But anyways, and on the left we have kind of the longest exemplars of necks from all the other things. Giraffes, of course, with her adorably puny little necks here. Um, this is an extinct rhinoceros, which also had a relatively long neck, but again, it's just a different, you know, scale altogether that we're talking about. But, as I hinted at, I'm less interested maybe in why they have long necks. Long necks are obviously useful. You can reach food stuffs you could not otherwise. Maybe the better question is, why don't other things have such long necks? And we need to know that so that you can understand what the big deal is about how they got away with it. And believe it or not, to answer that, we have to start with your lungs and your trachea, because that turns out to be really key. So if we zoom in on this really nice graphic here, you'll notice you can see the air going into the lungs, sitting around, using up oxygen, going back out. What it's not showing, because it's trying to like focus you on the travel, is that there is, of course, oxygen in that trachea and mouth still. Otherwise, you'd create a vacuum and it would collapse and that would just be harder to pull the air in and that would be bad. Why is that an issue? Well, 
all the air in those lungs can diffuse around, right? And that dead air space is air that you can't access then to a large degree. And you're like, but you're sure you can. You just diffuse in there. You just said it all diffuses around. And I did say that. The problem is that since your first breath of air, which you all took quite a while ago now, <laughs> um, you can't breathe it all out. When you expel your air, that is, you've taken as much oxygen out of that air as you can diffuse into, you know, across the blood uh, membrane into your bloodstream, you can't get all the air out of your lungs, no matter how much you're like, <sighs> you can't get it all out. Um, in fact, we, get, we have so much left over that aquatic mammals who don't want to be buoyant have to have specialized lungs that let them collapse further than we do, because otherwise it would be harder to swim. So we keep a lot of air still in our lungs, and then all that air in our trachea is also there. That's dead air that has already had oxygen extracted to the degree that our systems can, sitting there to intermingle with your next breath of air that comes in. Like, I don't want to give any of you complexes, but you've never had a breath of fresh air after the first one. <laughs> um, and that dramatically, of course, decreases how much oxygen we can extract, but more than that, it also constrains how long our necks can be. Because if that volume of air in the throat or in the trachea and mouth exceeded the volume of the lungs or was even a really significant fraction of it, you'd never get fresh air. And then, of course, you would not leap into the gene pool the same gusto as those who could bring air into their lungs do. It just wouldn't evolve. So this is a massive volumetric problem that mammal-style lungs have. And you might be like, but Scott, giraffes. And you're absolutely right, random hypothetical audience member. Giraffes do have, by mammal standards, fairly long necks. But to do it, they pay a heavy price in anatomical modifications. Their trachea are incredibly narrow. The diameter is very small to decrease that dead air space. And their lungs have to be substantially larger as a fraction of body mass compared to other like hoofed mammals. And that does allow them to both decrease dead air space and then overcome it in their lungs. But the cost of that is far more resistance when they're breathing in or out through that narrow trachea. Just like trying to drink through a cocktail straw is a lot harder than a regular straw. And simply larger masses to move around. That is more muscular exertion required for every inspiration and expiration. So, Giraffes, as a result, devote a significantly higher part of their daily energy budgets just to the act of breathing than do other mammals. So you could conclude that their necks, whatever they're for, are really, really useful. <laughs> but also, they're bumping up against sort of the boundary of what mammals can achieve with this sort of respiratory system. It's also worth noting on a side here, because I teach comparative physiology, and the standard physiological textbook talks about how awesome our lungs are with all our little alveoli, the really tiny, tiny sacs in there that if you have a standard college text will tell you something that like if you unfolded every one of them would cover uh, a tennis court for the most disgusting game of tennis ever played. Um, it is a lot of surface area, and it does allow for the gas exchange that is possible to occur quickly, but that's basically making up for these other very significant problems which is A, those little alveoli still are only using what's called concurrent gas exchange, which I'm not going to go into today, but it basically limits the amount of oxygen you can extract under ideal conditions to around 50% of the oxygen available, after which the diffusion gradient no longer favors you know, motion into the bloodstream. The dead air space means, of course, you're already mixing your fresh air with air that you've already extracted oxygen from as much as you can. And then on top of it, because we have to breathe out we're limiting the actual time that air is sitting in our lungs doing gas exchange to not 100% of the time, significantly less, probably 60, 70%. Um, these are all a big deal, actually. Um, alveoli are great, but they basically let us overcome this problem by having diaphragms in relatively larger tidal volumes or the amount of air you pull in. And mammals in general breathe far more frequently than other organisms do, like a bird and a 
a mammal, since they're both warm-blooded, of about the same mass, mammals breathe about three times more frequently than a similar-sized bird does. Or another way of thinking about this, you all probably know that climbing to the top of Mount Everest is not a great idea. They uh, actually label these helpfully death zone if you're trying to understand where mammals can live. <laughs> that is a real diagram from a real textbook. I did not make that up. Um, but birds have no problem going up there. There are literally birds that migrate over the Himalayas. So something fundamentally different is going on here. And it turns out that whole difference is connected to sauropods on their necks. All right, so let's dive in deeper. What and how and why? So the first thing you should know is what birds are doing before we can try to extrapolate that possibly to our giant behemoth sauropods, right? So birds do a couple things. They shrink their actual gas exchange networks, um, which are cross currents. They're already getting a lot higher percentage of oxygen pulled out anyways into really tiny, dense little networks of cross-current blood flow and airflow. And because they can get so much oxygen extracted out this way, the actual gas exchange part of the lungs is very small compared to the overall respiratory system. We basically use the entire system for gas exchange. They only use a small part of it. The rest of it, they expand into non-gas exchange portions of their lungs, or what we call air sacs. We tend to think of them, and even anatomy books often treat them like an ancillary structure, but they're just specialized out pockets of the lungs that don't do gas exchange. They just hold air. And that might be like, well, how does that help them? But wait. The thing is, those expanded air sacs, those out pockets of the lungs that don't do gas exchange, are about twice the size of the gas exchange part of the lungs that's actually in, the, uh, in their torso. That is, it completely overwhelms any issue of dead airspace, even in long-necked species. And they actually take it one step further. Um, the air sac system not only is twice as large as the gas exchange portion, but they have concentrated out pockets both behind the area that, that does the gas exchange and in front of it. So, when air is breathed in with oxygen by birds, this is the front end of the bird here, probably wasn't obvious from this diagram, I apologize. <laughs> um, it flows past and around the gas exchange part of the lungs to air sacs in the back part of the bird. And then it starts to move forward to do gas exchange, eventually collecting in the anterior or front part of the air sac system before it's breathed out again. But the thing is, when this is moving through here, doing gas exchange into the forward air sacs, they're breathing more gas in. So whereas every time you breathe you know, air in, as much of that air as possible goes right back out, it takes two breaths for a bird to expel the initial air that came into the system. Now, this totally overwhelms dead airspace, so they can have nice long necks, not a problem. But also, there's basically always gas exchange going on because they can be inspiring air again into this posterior air sac to start moving through after, you know, as this is moving through into the anterior air sac and gathering to be breathed out. So they've dramatically minimized the downtime of their lungs as well. This is a diagram of it that's animated. And if you follow it in, it goes again behind, through, and then out. You can see it kind of going slowly while another breath comes in before that goes out. It takes a while to sort of <laughs> focus in on. It's not at all how we think about breathing. But this is how birds take all their breaths every day of their lives, albeit at roughly a third the rate we would. And if you think about it, this actually explains a bunch of things. Of course, the whole birds can fly over the Himalayas and you cannot part. But also, mammal anatomy is almost always congruent with this fact. Most mammals have gone for short-necked, relatively large-headed configurations compared to birds because we have to. We don't have lungs that can make this easily possible. And when we try it, 
a la drafts, we pay a strong energetic price for it. And since starvation or things directly associated with low nutrition, like not fighting disease as well and stuff, tend to be one of the major selective pressures, things that are higher energy budgets are really strongly selected against most of the time. Anyways, birds, of course, frequently have a bow plan or overall body build that allows them to have nice, long, skinny necks. That's why. Um, I will note that birds probably have long, skinny necks more often than you think. If you look at like a robin or a cardinal, it doesn't look like it has terribly you know, long, thin neck there. That's actually a, a lie being told by their contour feathers. Those contour feathers kind of smooth them out aerodynamically and cover up the long, thin neck underneath. If you dissect one, like we do in my comparative anatomy lab, you'll see that they are still long, folded up, skinny necks underneath there. Um, if you've had a budgie or a parakeet, they, they're the same thing. They look like they have short, stocky necks, but they have long, thin necks, kind of in an S-curve underneath all that floof. And here's a great example of this. Not such a long neck. Long neck. <laughs> Okay, so great. Hopefully I've convinced you that birds have pretty great respiratory systems and it clearly solves their ability to have long necks. But oh, before I go on, you know the canary in a mine shaft? This is why. The reason they don't use cats or rodents in a mine shaft is because they have the exact same respiratory system you do. The whole being much more efficient at extracting oxygen thing that birds have going for them efficiently extracts anything else in the atmosphere as well. So if there's something bad for you, the bird's getting it at a much higher rate into its blood system just as they're able to pull much more oxygen out in each breath. So it's not like miners just had it out for canaries. I, I don't think. <laughs> but regardless of whether they did or not, there's good physiological reasons why this happened. Uh, if not good ethical reasons necessarily, depending on how you feel about canaries. But um, all right, so, so can we say anything useful then about sauropods and their necks and whether they did this. Um, luckily, it turns out there's a whole bunch of anatomical features associated with this and some of them preserved directly in bones. And that's a really important thing obviously to paleontologists who study vertebrates is that you can find some sort of anatomical correlate in the bone that will only be there if it has a similar system to a living animal today. And the ones I'm going to cover, for the sake of brevity, um, are the fairly intuitive hollow spaces in the vertebrae, literally where they're invaded by air sacs. And then the somewhat less intuitive issue of deeply recessed spaces between ribs in the rib cage. OK. So vertebrae. It turns out, if you look at most bird vertebrae and all sauropod vertebrae, they have extensive pneumatic openings and excavations in them, um, oftentimes far more extensive than what you can see externally with these nice little pointers here. Um, they often have giant interior volumes that are also fed from the outside and hollowing out significant parts of the inner bone. Um, and there are several lines of evidence as to why this matches the bird situation, but I'm just going to leave you for now with they match the shape and morphology and, importantly, the distribution. I've told you that um, birds, it's important for their two-step breathing to have like a kind of hind air sac system and a fore air sac system. You can see the changeover, sometimes even with entire gaps where they stop being innervated or pneumatized, sorry. Uh, by air sacs in the middle, so we know that they had like that fore and aft air sac system the same way birds do. And there's probably little reason to have a separate system like that unless you're using it as a sort of two-step breathing system. By the way, everything I'm saying here is also true of the meat-eating theropod dinosaurs, which are in fact closer to birds. Um, that's probably not surprising. That's literally where birds probably got it from. But we're not talking about theropods today, even though they eat lawyers in Jurassic Park and are otherwise sexy. Um, we're talking about sauropods, so let's get back to lungs. Um, OK. So here's this thing about deep recesses in the rib cage. Most everything else that isn't a sauropod or a bird or a theropod um, has rib heads that are relatively small and attach up high so that if you were to look at the 
inside of the torso, it's really quite smooth in there with the connective tissue covering up sort of the little gaps between vertebrae and stuff. And that's important because our lungs move around quite a bit. Not just like out and back, but up and down as like our, our um, uh, oh, I had a total brain freeze, sorry. <laughs> as your diaphragm um, continues to like allow your lungs to expand, they move in there and they need that ability to squish around so the smoothness of the interior of an animal is important. And you can see this in mammals, lizards, crocodilians, all the things that have not two-part air sac-based lungs do this. But going back to what we learned about the bird system, the actual gas exchange part of the lungs, those lungs are very small and they're rigid. And they're rigid for a good reason. Air is being forced through like a bellows from the hind air sacs to the front air sacs, and they've miniaturized all those little crossovers for the cross current gas exchange. So they need it to be rigid to hold that whole system together, and something else has to do with the moving of the air forward. So you want that to be protected, and ideally for something to help keep it in place to maintain the rigidity. And the way this is accomplished is by literally pushing those lungs as high up against the top of the rib cage as possible and having very tall rib heads, giant double-headed ribs with big excavations between them that the lungs literally grow around so there are divots in the lungs in life. Now I can't show you sauropod lungs today, unfortunately, but that big corrugated sort of rib cage in the upper part is a thing we can see. And, oh, that's just a close up. See, big corrugated grooves between ribs. Smooth. So if we take a look, all of these are the kinds of animals that would have smooth internal rib cages, even this one, because the rib heads are small and up and out of the way. Here's a sauropod vertebrae and set of ribs, and this giant head here is not the top of the rib cage. That's up here. So literally, they've got this giant corrugation going on that's even larger than it is in your average bird today. And this pretty much precludes any other respiratory system but that two-step air sac surrounded respiratory system. Because otherwise, there'd be no way for it to function. <laughs> there'd be bones literally in the way of the lungs from their proper function. So, yay. Look at that, it makes sense now, right? No dead airspace problem because I have small lungs but giant air sacs, and not just here, but like going down the tail, going up the neck, the air sac systems go everywhere, they hollow out the bones. And so the necks can be as long or as short as is selectively favored in their given environment. That's great, it turns out this air sac system, not necessarily the breathing part itself, also helps explain their big size probably. So it wasn't really two random issues after all. <laughs> I tricked you. All right, so first note, mammals like to be big. I know I'm gonna, I've said a lot of smack about mammals already in a respiratory system, and I'm gonna have some more smack about our ability to grow large on land, but you know, many of my best friends are mammals, and I don't wanna seem like I'm coming down on them too hard. <laughs> Mammals are great at being big in the water. When whale ancestors first became aquatic, it only took about 12 million years before they got sauropod sized. And of course, ultimately, the biggest whales became the largest vertebrates to ever live. So mammals are great at being big. But for some reason, we're not terribly good at doing it when we have to hold ourselves up against gravity. And this begs the question, what is it about sauropods then that let them go where no mammal can go at that size? That wouldn't have played nearly as well for Star Trek. Okay, so here are the four features we're gonna look at um, that are related to this. And I would say you can also make some growth and life history arguments and you can make some ecology arguments, but we're not gonna make those today because I do eventually have to wrap this up. So we'll cover these four anatomical characters that I do feel are key aspects to understanding why sauropods are so good at being whale-sized without having to live in the water. Um, one is, in fact, the air sacs, or 
not the air sacs, but the hollow bones themselves. I'll explain in a sec. Um, and then relating to those, the ability to get literally larger vertebrae than mammals have. And those are truly tied together. Um, then it turns out that having a big old tail probably plays a really important role to being large on land. And their pelvis um, are much better adhered to their vertebral column than mammals are. So let's go through those. The first thing to know is that hollow bones are actually stronger. OK, they're better at resisting torsion and are initially stiffer than solid bones of this, or solid anything of the same mass. It's true of bones, it's true of eye beams, it's true of like pipes versus metal bars. Um, it is the downside of hollow tubes is when they do finally give way, they catastrophically fail. They get that kind of kinked crease and they go, whereas solid objects, when they go past the point in Hooke's Law where they collapse, are a little bit more graceful about how they degrade. But pretty much, if you're at that point, you're screwed no matter what kind of bones you have. <laughs> so the advantage of having hollowed out tube shapes or other complex hollowed out shapes in your vertebrae is the initial resistance of torsion and strain prior to failure is much, much higher. They're just naturally stiffer. Of course, you can't really hollow out a bone if you don't have something to put in there, right? But there's another aspect of the story, which is going to feel counterintuitive, especially, has anyone taken an ornithology class? OK, cool. So you're going to be with me on this. I won't have to like deprogram you. All right, so here's the thing that is very weird. I have two plots for you here. Looking at skeletal, oh, wait, because the PDF was old and scanned. I'm sorry. We're looking at skeletal mass, skeletal mass on the y-axis and body mass on the x-axis. And we got mammals over here and birds over there. And you can't, I'm sure, read the actual equations there, but they're very close together. The y-intercept and the slope are, like, you could just group them all together, and the r-squared value for predicting the distribution gets negligibly worse. Or in plain English, birds and mammals have the exact same amount of bone as a fraction of their adult body weight. The reason I made the ornithology crack is everyone says that birds' bones are lighter than mammals, right? They have hollow bones, they're lighter. And that turns out to be completely wrong. If you take a 20 kilogram bustard, some other large bird, 20 kilogram, I don't know, dog that died of natural causes, <laughs> um, and you, you know, weigh them and then you deflesh them and go through all things, you weigh the skeletons, they will weigh within a couple of you know, percentage points of one another. Why should this be? This is also true, by the way, of lizards. It becomes less true when you go down to amphibians and there's like no correlation when you get to fish. So what's going on? Bone during development is by far the most expensive tissue to grow. Not to maintain, but to grow initially, like in utero, in ovo, when you're developing. Um, especially because much of it has to go through a cartilage precursor stage before then mobilizing minerals to interlay in a composite with protein. It's, it's expensive. And it turns out you probably only can devote so much of your metabolic energy to it. And so animals basically make that much use of the bones that they can grow. And of course, you're on a pretty fixed income when you're in an egg or you know, in utero growing. You can't do a whole lot to go gather more food if you want to. Um, and so once you got to true egg laying and then later on live birth again, but through the whole view of tetrapods, this pattern has strong, deep developmental regulation. You can't cheat how much bone you get to use, even though it might be really useful to do so. So here's the thing. Birds and also sauropods can cheat it. They can't grow more bone, but by having hollow bones, they literally get bigger skeletons using the same amount of bone tissue. Right? Think of a solid pipe. If you're going to make a pipe of the same length and make it hollow, it has to get wider <laughs> to allow the hollowness to be on the inside. So they're literally getting bigger skeletons with better leverage for muscles and everything else without cheating the how much bone can I grow up with rule that seems to affect all uh, tetrapods on land. 
Um, and you can actually see this. These are, this is a relatively scrawny little sauropod that comes out at about the same mass as uh, an Asian elephant, so it made a good comparison, even though, like I said, it's relatively small in terms of uh, bone size, but they just, they're more massive. Their vertebrae are taller and have much larger centra. They just have literally bigger skeletons. And of course, the elephant's making it worse by throwing a whole bunch into its head, which is wasteful from a, I want to have a big skeleton point of view, but really great for a, I want to have a big brain and protected point of view. You know, it's trade-offs. Um, but hey, there's a real sauropod, a sauropod sauropod. Look at that chunky guy. It's thick with at least three Cs. Um, if you don't get that, ask your kids. <laughs> so this is the kind of thing sauropods can do. If they can throw a bunch of air in between, they can make giant skeletons with much better leverage, and that literally makes it easier to be big. All right, let's talk about that tail now. Um, so obviously mammals either don't have tails, like ourselves, or they have like largely non-muscular tails. I mean, I know they have muscles in them. If, if you have pets, you've seen them swish them around or whatever, greet you with them. But they don't have any muscles that are relevant to the limbs. But that's a weird mammal thing. The primitive condition, which dinosaurs all retained up until birds, who, you know, fly, um, is to have these giant muscles, the vicata femoralis longus muscles, there will be a quiz later, um, and they, their sole job is to retract the hind leg by inserting on the femur there. Now, if this seems counterintuitive to you, here's a little fun thought experiment. What is the biggest, you can just think in your head, what is the biggest muscle in your arm? Or your biggest arm muscle, I should say, to be more accurate here. And the answer is the pectoralis complex, which is not on your arm. That's actually why it can get so large. It spreads across your chest. It has this whole other origin, right? And that gives our arms a lot more um, muscle that can act on it than just what you could fit into the tubes of our arms otherwise. The cauda femoralis, these big muscles here, they're the pectoral muscles times 10 of dinosaur hind limbs. This is literally the biggest muscle in most non-bird dinosaurs' bodies. It's also, if you've ever eaten gator at like a, you know, Louisiana-themed restaurant, what you're eating, they cut them up into little medallions and they're pretty tasty if a little chewy. Um, that is a thing we don't have. So we compensate by having gluteal muscles, causes to be the butt of jokes. Um, if you're small enough to not need the support, we compensate by doing lots of hyperextension and contraction of the back itself, like a cheetah if you've ever seen it run, or even if you have a cat, dogs don't do it as much, but the um, opening and closing of the back as they run to help like, literally make the legs go further and, and come together faster. Um, we have to find all these sort of ways of getting around not having a tail. At least a tail with tail contracting, or you know, muscles for, for pulling them back. And not only is this a big muscle, the leverage is perfect. It's literally pulling straight back on the way it wants to go, whereas like gluteal muscles have to wrap around. And the leverage is much worse. So if you want to be big, again, having leverage in your favor is usually a good way to go. All right. And as long as we're at the uh, back end of the animals, let's also look at the sacrum. The sacrum is the vertebrae that literally attach the pelvis and anchor it to the rest of the vertebral column. Um, in most mammals and dinosaurs, they actually fuse together. And sometimes in older animals, would also literally fuse to the upper hip bone or the ilium, um, creating a nice solid joint. Um, mammals have three-ish uh, vertebrae, but, but Sauropods have five plus, and other dinosaurs like the Triceratops have like a dozen or more. Let me help you visualize this. Here's an extinct elephant seen from the end you don't want to be standing on for too long. Um, this is a tail coming down here. Those are the ilial muscles. This is a giant pelvis. It has to hold up a pretty big animal. The articular spot is like right there and right there. It's a really small percentage of that pelvis. And if you remember, several slides ago, which I'm sure you probably have forgotten, um, when we looked at that, little, that one sauropod and that one uh, Asian elephant reconstruction, the pelvis was already small compared to like a dinosaur pelvis. 
So this is a side view of a sauropod pelvis. These are all sacral bones here. If you look at them in top view, they actually expand out. They're basically fusing on from the very front of the ilium all the way to the very back. And then they're also coossifying all the way through. So it's just a giant hunk of bone there to take all that pressure when you walk along and you weigh 10, 15, 25, 45, 60 tons. So to recap, sauropods have bigger skeletons because they have hollow skeletons, which allow them to have literally larger bones, including larger vertebrae, which take up most of the mass. Um, they have giant leg-based retraction muscles for their hind legs, which we've simply given up upon long before mammals came to like get bigger than cat size. And they take their pelvis and anchor all that stuff, including the forces coming from that tail, to their vertebral column in a way that basically doesn't allow um, injury to occur nearly as easily. Um, this is interesting because like, rather than looking at elephants and th thinking, man, could elephant-sized sauropods or bigger possibly be as athletic as mammals? The answer is not only yes, it's like they're almost certainly more athletic than similarly sized elephants because they don't have all these things putting them behind the eight ball to pull it off. Which again, I know our mammal chauvinism is like taking a hit here, but that's the way it is. And it does beg one last question before I, I ask you if you have any other questions, um, which is why are mammals so bad at this? What is it about mammals that don't allow us to do this? I mean, our respiratory system, and I don't have time to go into it now, but there is a reason for our respiratory system being the way it is. The uh, ancestors of mammals first dominated the land before the Mesozoic at a really heightened level of atmospheric oxygen, whereas the dinosaurs took over in the early Mesozoic at a period of really low atmospheric oxygen. And so literally, our ancestral lung condition evolved when it was easy to get oxygen out of the air. <laughs> and we lost to another group at about the same time as getting oxygen out of the air was super important. All right, so why else, though? Why are we bad at this? So I think the perspective to keep in mind, also it is really hard to find sad looking mammal pictures online, so I just want to take some you know, victory lap here for finding these. Um, <laughs> mammals, true crown mammals within our modern group, um, really appear shortly after dinosaurs do. They have a long history of like sort of stem proto-mammal things that we could talk about some other day in theory. Um, but they appear and they get small. The first two-thirds of mammal evolution is all being, remember, like rodent-sized to like ca maybe cat-sized at the most. We've only had 66 million years since then, for goodness sake. <laughs> Basically, two-thirds of mammal evolution is about trying to be little and flexible and hiding in holes or up trees. And we've had to undo all that two-thirds of mammal developmental evolutionary history to do as well as we have so far. So I think to be fair to us, we should say we can't do this yet. Give us another 50 or 100 million years, maybe we'll be doing it too, you know? <laughs> so when you have all that perspective on the history of both groups, on the anatomical and respiratory differences between them, it's not really surprising that, sure, we can get to roughly the same size, mammals even a little bigger, but mammals can only do it aquatically so far. And dinosaurs are able to get just about to whale size on land and did it for a really long period of time. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, laughing at some of my lame jokes. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have. And uh, I'll be repeating them when you ask, just so you know, so everyone can hear at home too. Thank you. Questions? Not all at once. All right, thank you. Thank you for an interesting talk. I enjoyed that. About approximately what is the density difference between the mammal bones and, and bird bones? OK, so that's a great question. It was about what the density is between bird bones and mammal bones. Um, 
That is a fantastic question. I don't think I've seen, I know the raw data is there to be found, but normally most studies look at the actual density of the living animals, and birds are significantly less dense than mammals are. Uh, the specific uh, gravity of your average mammal, or for that matter, lizard or crocodile, is very close to that of water, not surprisingly, because most of them are, like 0.98 or so. And birds can be like down in the 0 0.8, 0 0.85 range overall. Um, but that, of course, includes a significant soft tissue component as well. Uh, I will say that a couple of dinosaurs, like Camarasaurus, which is a sauropod, is named for the camerate pattern of hollows in its vertebrae, where like, if you look at a cross section of the, the big centrum, the round part of the vertebrae on the bottom, it's like as much as 80% air in a cross section. So that's significant, but of course some of the upper uh, bony processes that support the ribs, for example, would be denser, so I don't have offhand to answer that, sorry. Great question. A mm -hmm. uh, comment from online from a viewer called Todd. Probably the most interesting talk on dinosaurs I've ever heard. Way to go. Thank, thank question. You. Is dinosaur soft tissue ever preserved, or do you figure this all out by deduction? Should I repeat that, or does that? Yeah, go ahead and repeat it, please. So the question was about soft tissues and whether soft tissues in, in non-bird dinosaurs ever preserve, or whether I had to do this all via deduction. Not me, of course, I'm drawing on several researchers' works here, not just myself. Um, so we do get soft tissue preservation. Uh, obviously not as often as we would like, because we'd like it a lot. Um, but there are quite a few instances of impressions of external surfaces, skin, scale, feathers. There are some specimens that have preserved impressions or molds of organs. Um, there isn't a sauropod with that, however. Most of the ones that have this kind of thing are either the meat-eating theropods, which we talked about, or uh, some of their less closely related uh, ornithischian dinosaur relatives, like, like the duck-billed dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs. Um, which means that, obviously, on the one hand, that there's more inference being done on sauropods. On the other hand, even when you don't have exactly the soft tissue you would like, it's a really powerful test because when you actually test it against phylogeny, you make a whole bunch of predictions about what the distribution of these characters would be and how it would change across the tree. And if you find these soft tissue animals and they match those predictions, then you dance the happy dance and hurry up and publish. Um, and if it doesn't, then you say it was someone else's idea and hurry up and publish. And also, then we are able to recalibrate our inferences based upon those. So I can't say that we have like sauropod lungs yet. Um, and I don't, given their size, if we ever will, although, you know, fingers crossed. Um, but we do have some, yeah. Another question from online. What classes would you suggest a high schooler take if they are interested in pursuing a career in paleontology? So the question is, what courses should you take in high school if you want to pursue a career in paleontology? I'm going to go with economics first. Um, but honestly, all the biology, and if you have it, geology you can take. And if there's no geology, physics doesn't hurt because all the classical mechanics and stuff that you would cover would definitely be important for the kind of comparative morphological inferences we're talking about here. Uh, Honestly, you can't, you can't go too wrong with any of it. Uh, many paleontologists work on, in geochemical processes to teach us interesting things. Um, then you'd want to take all the chemistry you could, so all the science you can. Another question online, are there other methods of organizing oxygen slash carbon dioxide exchange in other vertebrates? Are there other ways of organizing oxygen exchange in other vertebrates. Okay, so that's a good question. Um, it turns out that all, all vertebrates not on the mammal line, on the reptile line, that would be lizards, crocs, dinosaurs, including birds. Because if reptile means anything, birds are reptiles now. Sorry, that's a different talk. Um, everything on the not mammal line has some degree of 
cross-current gas exchange. That is, all of them can actually extract more oxygen from the air they breathe in than mammals can. But in non-warm-blooded animals, basically what they're doing is getting away with even lower frequencies of breathing. They're just saving the calories and breathing even less frequently. And they don't have the two-part breathing system. Instead, what they do is they specialize, like their lungs look much more like lungs with sort of giant lobes, but the gas still goes to the back and then jumps forward through each lobe, getting lower and lower, creating the kind of cross current um, exchange as they go, because the blood's going the opposite direction as the air goes through the lobes. So yes, there are basically proto versions of how birds do it. Um, presumably, there's some ancestral condition to how mammals do it, but unfortunately, the whole mammal line, except for the crowned mammals that are alive today, uh, has lost out and there are no more left. So, yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, tonight on PBS, there's a NOVA program called Alaskan Dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it's, it, the little blurb is paleontologists discover that dinosaurs thrived in unlikely places such as the cold and dark Arctic Circle. And uh, you had mentioned some about where they're found around, and then um, Antarctica, and then only just recently in the last couple decades, I think you said when they started really digging around, they found them there too. But so th this NOVA program is making it sound like they like recently, maybe in the same time I discovered them in the Arctic Circle. But you know, if, you're, if they were on all the continents, which do reach above the Arctic Circle, so can you explain what might be the difference in newly finding in Antarctica, but a NOVA program making it sound like newly finding it in the Arctic Circle as well? Sure. Yeah, it sort of seemed like they should have been found there. There's a longer discussion here on sensationalism and uh, TV programming to be had. The question is about, uh, there's a, as I hear, a pretty darn good uh, show on Arctic dinosaurs. Uh, so now we're talking about like north slopes of Alaska and stuff. Um, dinosaurs being found and what new secrets it tells us. Um, the actual work done on this goes back a ways, like more than a decade. Uh, the Walking with Dinosaurs BBC movie that had like talking but otherwise pretty accurate dinosaurs in it, um, which I worked on, we were using that, what they were finding in that back in like 2012 or something like that. Um, but remember that the pipeline in science is slow, right? Publication takes time. And one challenge with dinosaur specimens is they take an immense amount of time to both collect and then prepare before you can even start to study them for publication. So the wheels turn very slowly. When you see newspaper headings about a new dinosaur species being named today, or you see a, a special, um, the people who work in and around the field have known about that for a while. They've given presentations at conferences just like any other field and stuff like that. There's just embargoes on those. So they're not wrong. There's a lot of neat things that are being learned or confirmed by this, these cool new uh, Alaskan dinosaurs. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're found in 2020, I guess. Where would these Alaskan dinosaurs have been? What latitude would they have been at before the continents drifted? Um, I don't remember the exact paleolatitude. It's not quite as far north as today, but it's still well within the Arctic Circle. Um, you're still getting like three months of large, you know, largely dark days and stuff like that. Okay, um, but where you find a dinosaur fossil today does not mean that's where the, the latitude or longitude they were living at when they died. That's correct. That's a very good question. Um, the question was, how does the latitude today where you find a dinosaur correlate with the latitude and longitude that they lived at at the time? We have a name for that, paleo latitude, not surprisingly. No creativity in, in science naming. Um, so Basically, that's up to the people who are studying continental drift and continental placement. Um, we're just piggybacking on their data set when we do this. But, you know, that's been done fairly effectively with people who work on paleo meg strata. And th th there's a whole lot of other stuff we could go into on that. Um, basically, we're taking a fairly well-known sequence of where the continents were, the time period when it was at, which lets you kind of place them on the animation, if you will, and then knowing how the current you know, position on the continent relates to where it was then, and that gives you the transformation to give you your paleo latitude and longitude. Yep. Question from online. First of all, great talk. And the question is, when you just have a few bones, as shown in some of your comparative illustrations, 
How do you estimate the total neck size? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in that one, I specifically had a diagram where I was showing the biggest known animals. And there's this like apparent Murphy's law of collecting giant things that like, the bigger it is, the less likely it is to be complete. Um, so what I've done in all those cases is they have fairly close relatives who are smaller. And so you're basically building a composite in order to scale up the missing parts. I actually literally draw all the missing parts um, and then black them out, which feels like a horrible waste. But it's Photoshop, so they're still there under a layer. Um, and I do that because while maybe other people are more talented and can get away with it, I find that if I don't do that, I make horrifying mistakes like of basic proportions. Because like if you're like, eh, the neck's probably this long, like I at least do not do a good job. <laughs> So I actually draw them all out, and usually, like, if there's enough specimens, we'll go ahead and do like a regression on them to like try to predict the reasonable range for it to be, and draw those out before blacking the stuff out. And that's not because what I drew is literally right; it just keeps me honest about the proportions of the organisms. So, how do sauropods' lung function adapt to day and nighttime changes in weather conditions and altitude differences? So the question was, how do sauropod lungs basically adapt to different weather and altitude conditions? And day and nighttime changes. Oh, and day and um, So the answer is going to be really well. Um, sauropods, I mean, we can't literally obviously go put like a spirometer in a sauropod's mouth and test how much air is moving through. but. They have all the basic components we see in the modern living dinosaur, AKA bird system. And since they can like literally fly at altitudes that would cause us to pass away in, even if it's like just a significant fraction of that using as near as we can tell the exact same parts, there is little difference that's gonna change in terms of oxygen extraction. Now one thing that's an interesting question and is an issue that needs, well, probably will be addressed further is, what it does for cooling or temperature regulation. Um, we tend to rely on sweating, as with these lights I'm starting to do myself right now to you know, thermoregulate. And we can, of course, also pant or otherwise expire um, moisture out when we go. And all of those things uh, can take you know, advantage of like, the latent temperature of evaporation and stuff to cool ourselves. Most non-mammals don't sweat. But birds today do make extensive use of uh, evaporation via their air sac system when they breathe out to help cool themselves down. And again, this is hard to extrapolate one to one. It will take some significant probably modeling to um, get a handle of. But sauropods are really big, obviously. And probably staying cool was a much bigger challenge than staying warm was. And so the role that their lungs and air sac system had in evaporative cooling and helping them shed heat is a probably important but not currently quantified um, avenue to be explored. Uh, if birds use similar breathing mechanisms as dinosaurs, they must be more efficient in taking oxygen off air than mammals are. Why are birds not as large as mammals, given that they started out ahead of small mammals? Sure. So the question is, why aren't birds as big as mammals when they have this awesome breathing system. Um, so first of all, it's worth noting that there are quite a few large birds that are now extinct that evolved in the Cenozoic, the age of mammals. Uh, South America was largely most of the top predator roles up until the last five to seven million years were actually birds that were flightless. Um, we think of ratites now as being just a couple species like ostriches and stuff, but there is quite a large ratite radiation for most of the last 30 million years on most continents. Um, there were uh, the, the giant elephant birds got up to like probably as much as 800 pounds. So there were some awfully big ground birds. Having said that, birds are very specialized. And even by the time the other dinosaurs died, they'd already lost all teeth. They had pretty much irrevocably altered their limbs to be wings and not grasping organs. Um, so they'd really committed to flight. And flight has a very strong selective pressure on minimizing size and mass. Um, so the odds are stacked against them. But as soon as they give up flight, you do see them get big frequently. I mean, even uh, emperor penguins, you wouldn't want to have step on your toes if you were around them. Um, so 
like, give them enough time, we may see yet larger sized ones, but mammals at this point are in the sort of pull position when it comes to the large charismatic megafauna roles on land, and dinosaurs will sort of have a hard time breaking back in, I feel like, at this point, assuming there's much of an ecosystem for them to fight over anyways in the distant future, so. Uh, in line with the difference between mammals and birds and pre-bird dinosaurs breathing systems, is there a similar uh, clear-cut difference between uh, like vocal sound generation in terms of like does the voice box of birds and other dinosaurs work like ours does? Yep, that's a great question. So the question was, um, is there a clear difference in the vocalizations and the anatomy that does the vocalizing between mammals and birds? And the answer is definitely yes. The, the voice box vocal cords of mammals are our own thing. Birds use a feature called the syrinx, which is uh, located down as sort of vibrating flaps by where the uh, bronchial tubes first split from the trachea. Um, and they are caused to vibrate with air passing over them there, much further down you know, than like our own um, sound making organs. And so it, it dramatically alters sort of the pitches and frequencies of uh, sounds they can make. Um, you know, there's probably a reason why more birds chirp today and more mammals roar, which unfortunately means all the roaring in Jurassic Park might not be very plausible, but a chirping T-Rex probably wouldn't have been as scary. You're expecting um, a suspension of disbelief? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's fine, it's fiction, I know. Um, I, I have a 14-year-old that takes the movies, it's okay. Um, and actually, I should know that the syrinx is almost certainly a bird specialty feature, so we're not really sure in a lot of cases, what kinds of sounds dinosaurs made, but it wouldn't have been with mammalian vocal cords. Um, we do have a couple very, very far from sauropods or theropods, um, groups of like armored dinosaurs and ductile dinosaurs which seem to have resonating chambers built into their heads. And so that presumably allowed them to make different sounds. Those are often relatively low frequency sounds. Um, so maybe low end bellowing would have been a thing. And there have been attempts to model this including some people who've actually built like a PVC tube into the right shape and tried to play them. But there are obvious differences in like the amount of air a person could pass through that and a three ton dinosaur could. So probably more work needs to be done there to get a, a feel for what range of sounds could be made that way. Along these lines, um, it seems the first time I heard the call of a sandhill crane, I thought for sure it was a pterodactyl. <laughs> it's got that very rattly, yep called very different than anything else I know of. I don't know any other crane calls because I've never heard any cranes. Um, what do we know about the fossils at the cellular level for dinosaurs? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the question is, what do we know about fossils at the cellular level for dinosaurs? And I'm going to give you two specific answers. There's more, but the sort of, I think, two coolest top line ones. One is, some of the feathered dinosaurs that have been preserved, especially the ones coming from uh, northeastern China, uh, actually preserve enough detail that you can see the shape of organelles within the cells. Wow. And that includes uh, the various uh, organelles related to pigmentation. So it turns out that like different types of carotenoids and other structures that actually imbue the cell with color in the feathers themselves, um, different shape. So if you go through and you sample with like an SEM, in a whole lot of places, you can basically in a couple of these specimens build up a pattern um, of what the coloration was like. Um, so you can reconstruct not just imaginary colors, but something based on evidence. Yep, true story. People used to ask me, what will we never know? And I would always say color probably. And now I just don't take what will we never know questions. Um, <laughs> Never say never, apparently. Uh, and the other thing is, it turns out that birds looking at living animals have smaller genomes and literal base pair counts than other land or terrestrial vertebrates do. Um, both the smallest average size and also the smallest range of variance. Mammals generally have a much larger variance so do lizards, but amongst bats, amongst mammals, bats have a relatively smaller than average genome size also. And so there was some thought for a while that perhaps 
and here we go into arm waviness, but perhaps something about genome size and therefore cell size, which is dependent partly on it, um, is associated with flight or the needs of flight. I mean, it seems like a big coincidence that the two groups of living flying vertebrates would have some of the smaller genomes on average. Um, the, by the way, the relationship between size of the cell and size of the genome is literally, of course, the nucleus the size is determined by how much stuff is in it. <laughs> and the whole cell size is then based around that. And so although the correlation isn't perfect, it's a pretty strong one when you go ahead and map them out. So the neat thing is when you take dinosaur bones and you cut them into thin sections, look at them under microscopes, as you can see cell patterns within the bones the little lacuna where the living cells used to like lay down the actual um, uh, minerals to form bones or to repair the bones in this case. And so you can literally measure and you know get a bunch of them, of course, because of some error measurement, um, the size of cells in dinosaurs also. And when you do this, what you find out is that sauropods and theropods are in the bird range. So even though we don't have any non-bird dinosaur DNA, we know that in a decent chunk of big, large terrestrial dinosaurs, they had really tiny DNA by large, <laughs> by modern standards, and it's obviously therefore not connected to flight, whatever it's doing. Oh. I have speculations about that, but it would be like dancing around arm waving speculation, so I will not share. Arthur Graham science. <laughs> um, one last one, Diana says, I can't see trailers for your movie credits on your website. Uh, what were the movies again? Oh, so the question is, what, what movies did I work on? Yeah. Um, I've only worked on one actual theatrically released movie, which was uh, Walking with Dinosaurs, the BBC, like, it was the actual movie, not the uh, documentary of the same name that came out before. Okay. Um, and then I worked on several, like, documentaries, not surprisingly, where they wanted information for dinosaurs. Okay. Um, so Walking with Dinosaurs, the movie, yeah. not the documentary. Yep. Okay. Yes, I'm in the credits twice, not that I sat through three times and looked. <laughs> Stereo. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hope to see you next week for Bruce and the road ahead with electric vehicles. Thanks for coming tonight.